And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Hey, we're ready to get back in our Father's Word, book of Deuteronomy. Uh, in the Greek, meaning the second law, but actually no such thing. I like to translate it repeating the law, which Moses had an excellent uh, flair for doing in as much as he taught uh, as though he was speaking directly to lay persons. Now, many people uh, feel as a lay person, they only have to have a teacher that knows the law or they can hire a lawyer if it were in Hey, if you, it is meant that by our Father that all of us understand the law because it's very simple. The commandments and the statutes is very simple. And if you don't know them, you're headed for a life of trouble. It's, it's something that's why it should be taught over and over on the occasions that it was taught over and over so that people wouldn't forget. Why? If that's what makes you successful is knowing before the fact what it is our Father's instructions were to be successful, to have peace of mind. So it's important that you know the things that brings God's blessings into your family. It's that simple, basically, and that's why it is so very important that you be able to please the Father by understanding His rules, and they're not that complicated. They flow real sweetly whenever you understand idioms, figures of speech, metaphors that uh, are often used. But it's a very simple message. For our Father wasn't out to confuse someone or to make it difficult as far as the law is concerned. Now, if we were to be talking about parables, we would be in a different field. But when it comes to the law, everyone is supposed to know it. That's why it was repeated so often on, basically that's what the feast days came down to, was teaching. Well, and another subject for another time. Having said that, we're in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 10, let's go with it. And it shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land which he sware unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities which thou buildest not. And, and this prophecy carries on through to this day, where those that live right, your Christian nations, look at them. And I'm not knocking anyone else. I'm just saying, look at the blessings. Look, look where the ingenuity of God's blessings and leadings flow from. There's no great mystery in that. It's just a fact, all right? I'm talking about the migrations of the people into Europe and later to this great nation, these Americas, and how blessed they are. Verse 11, And houses full of all good things, which thou fillest not, and wells digged, which thou diggest not, vineyards and olive trees, which thou plantest not, when thou shalt have eaten and be full. And in the originally taking of the land, uh, uh, east and west of the Jordan, then uh, so it was. It was already occupied. It's amazing to me that while our father was allowing one generation to die off in the wilderness for disobedience, he blessed the others because he had people already there digging the wells and making the preparation. Many people have difficulty in understanding that, that he father would want the others done away with then, but he had his plan and his purpose, and God never uh, puts anything on anyone that they didn't deserve. Verse 12, Then beware, lest thou forget the Lord, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt, which from the house of bondage. In other words, they came out of Egypt much richer than they went in. Why? God ob observed and saw to it, I'll say, that they were paid adequately. Verse 13, Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and serve him and shalt swear by his name. If you want to have one verse that kind of sums it up, that will keep you uh, successful, you've got it there in that 13th verse. To revere God, that's to love him. Why? With what all he gives us? 
God is not out to destroy someone, to cause bad things to happen. People do that to themselves. God wants to bless his children. 14, ye shall not go um, after other gods, for the gods of the people which are round about from, um, of the gods of the people uh, which uh, are round about. Now, this is what you want to be very careful of. Jesus would teach concerning the baskets. Anytime you have a large gathering, I enjoy observing the people. Because I, I don't care if it's a shepherd's chapel gathering, you're going to have a bunch of doctrines drop that are as nutty as a fruitcake. I don't mean by the chapel. I'm talking about fringe uh, things that are absolutely not biblical. The people do not remain focused. So you got to be careful when you get around mixed doctrines, even if they claim to be Christian. You got to be very careful. Hey, every time Christ corrected someone, what did he say? Haven't you read? It is written. Friend, if it isn't written, and if you haven't read it, you better walk tenderly. All right? God always warned us about the fragments of picked up from the baskets when there was a large group of people gathered. Verse 15. For the Lord thy God is a jealous God among you. Now, don't, don't read over among you. He's with us. He never leaves us, nor does he forsake us. Lest the anger of the Lord thy God be kindled against thee and destroy thee from off the face of the earth. There comes a time when, hey, uh, he destroyed that one generation from off the face of the earth. Do you know how permanent that is? Where did they go when they left the face of the earth? Well, they went into the spiritual dimension, and boy, did they get a dressing down there on the other side of the gulf. Don't think God killed them. He didn't. He simply removed them to a different dimension. Verse 16, Ye shall not tempt the Lord your God as you tempted him in Masa. There is so, masa, of course, in the Hebrew tongue means temptation. Do you know? Do you know when? Um, do you know when Jesus used this same quote? It was in Matthew chapter four. Do you know who he used it against? He used it against Satan, because he would say, in uh, when Satan would say to Jesus, uh, "Jump down from there," quoting from Psalms ninety-one. And God has sworn he will protect you at all times, at any time. Well, that isn't what God said. And God doesn't like people putting on freak shows to prove God's real. He'll let you crash land, all right? But Jesus would say, uh, he would repeat that scripture in verse 7 of Matthew 4, who too, his first preaching was done to Satan. And it reads, it is written again, thou shalt not tempt, the Lord thy God. And it is interesting that the rock, the rock would repeat this scripture from the Old Testament. Yes, it's in the New Testament. The law hasn't changed. Christ said, I don't change a jot, not a tittle of it. That means even the sound of one little letter. So he repeated it. And I, it, what is ironic to me is that the rock who only the type in a rock was struck by Moses uh, uh, at uh, Masha. Only Moses struck it twice when God only told him to strike it once. And it would be that cause, that would be the reason that God would not allow Moses to enter the promised land. So what happened then at, um, at uh, Masha? Um, I can't help it, Numbers, uh, so that you, that you need to know, Numbers chapter 20, all right? And we're going to cover verse uh, 10, and Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together around the rock, and I have no doubt this is the scone of stone, the same today, Jacob's pillar, whatever you want to call it, and he said unto them, hear now, ye rebels, 
must we fetch you water out of this rock? God had already told him, all right, to strike it once. And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod he smote the rock twice, two times. And the water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their beast also. They were murmuring, griping, complaining, God feeding them with manna and quail. And they get a little thirsty and start whimpering and complaining at God. This upset Moses to the point that instead of striking once as God had instructed, he struck twice. What did God say? Uh, 12, and the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, because ye believe me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them. In other words, Moses was not going to get to cross over into the promised land. Do you know why the people were murmuring? Do you know why they tempted and why it was named tempted? They tempted Yah with their murmuring for not instantly removing their distress. Now you should learn from that lesson. Many people say, well, I believe in prayer, I'm gonna pray right now. And man, if it isn't answered Johnny on the spot, uh, then they are all upset. You're wasting your time praying if that's what you are. When you issue a prayer, God is going to answer it to the best of your benefit the best for your benefit because he has a plan for you. He's not going to give you something you might hurt yourself with or that would deter you for away from his plan. Now, it is real sad that when people, why would God be warning them about this in this case where he said, hey, your houses are already built, your wells are already digged, your, your crops are already in. People get lazy and when people uh, get uh, like uh, God uses the term fat kind, which is to say you're like a bunch of fat cows. You know, they don't, fat cows don't worry too much about where the next meal's coming from. And so it is with people. That's why God would call them in this same book of, uh, of Deuteronomy in chapter 32, Jeshurun, which is a play on the word Israel, where they're fat, lazy, and no good, quite frankly. Uh, uh, as far as looking to God for uh, their guidance and their leadership. So they pick up tidbits here and there, junk, that, uh, hey, it's all right to talk about something, but when you start putting it away up here in your forehead, you better be careful what you put in there. Garbage in, garbage out. Focus on the Word of God. As Christ would say to Satan, it is written. Friend, if it isn't written, uh, let's take the, the Pyramid of Giza, Giza. I find it fascinating, and I have no doubt in my mind that it was built in the first earth age, and there is a message in it, but I'm not going to worship the thing. I'm not going to make a religion out of it. I take it for what it is. I'm a realist, and anytime you lose re in touch with reality, you're in trouble, friend. That's what God is telling you here. Don't murmur. Don't complain. Don't be tempted to take a back road when the pavement will get you there a lot quicker and the pavement happens to be the way and the way is Christ, his teachings. He is the living word. If that isn't good enough for you, you're headed for trouble because there's only one other choice other than the way, the path with Christ, and that's the hell with Satan. So, you know, it's your choice. You make it totally and completely. So God was a little bit, he said, don't, don't tempt me. You never want to tempt God because he might take you up on it. And his decisions are very final. 17, back in Deuteronomy 6. Ye shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God and his testimonies and his statutes which he hath commanded thee. All three of them. And if you have a teacher worth, worth his salt, he will call it to your attention that you need to make a study and a differentiation between the three, which is a different subject of the law, and, and, um, and you should do it. If you're not able to do it on your own, I have a work of two tapes, which I think is about three hours of teaching on the law. 
that breaks uh, simply, it's not complicated, it simply teaches you how to tell the difference between commandments, statutes, and judgments, the law. That's important. There's none of it complicated, that's to say God's instructions. It is natural. There, there is one rule of the thumb, you know, I guess suppose through life that we learn these little things. If something is unnatural, it's not of God. You got that? If something is unnatural, if it's not the way God created it, somebody's hankying. And God doesn't like it. He's jealous. So there are little things, that the simplicity and the fact that realism is so important, especially in this generation. I don't know, how easily can you be misled? How easily? You know, uh, there are some people can make games because of sensationalism and drawing people to them to make them think they are something, and, and maybe innocently even. It's good to make a study of all things, but only that that is written, for God is jealous and he will cut you off. You understand? Now, does that mean you can't go anywhere, anytime? You can go any. Christianity sets you free, but at least be disciplined. That's what a disciple is. The word disciple comes from our word discipline or vice versa, I should say. That means a student who can concentrate and discipline themselves in focusing on God's word and no one else's. That's why a good teacher is always going to teach you how to study God's word, the law, the statutes, the commandments. So enough said, let's get on with it. Verse 18, and thou shalt do that which is right and good in the sight of the Lord. That, for what reason? You know, you want to always take these conditions very seriously, that it may be well with thee, and that thou mayest go in and possess the good land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers. God won't give you any more than you can take care of. I don't know how much you got. Hmm? It upsets some people when they hear me say that, but that's very true. God will only give you what you can take care of because if he gives you more than you can take care of, somebody's going to skin you out of it. They're going to rook do you. Do well, and God, it is his wish that you may do well. He owns everything. It's his to give, to see that you would, uh, retain if you follow him. It's that simple, my friend. Verse 19, to cast out all thine enemies from before thee as the Lord has spoken. Many people will let an enemy slip right into their mind. And I really wonder sometimes if they're bright enough to know it's an enemy for false doctrines. Verse 20, and when thy son asketh thee in time to come, saying, what mean the testimonies and the statutes and the judgments which the Lord our God hath commanded you? You teach your children. You teach them how to be successful. And hey, if you're one of these that teach them how to do business and leave God out of it, I'm sorry, they're going to amount to about what you do. And mon I'm not speaking monetarily. You might do quite well monetarily by ripping people off, but ill-gotten gains is a sin, a big sin. Riches with God's blessings are God's blessings, just that. There's nothing wrong with being rich. A lot of people say, a Christian should be a pauper, pauper practically. Well, that's not written. That's a lie. Don't listen to liars. If you have God's blessings, then you have sufficient. And, and riches to me is having a roof over your head and plenty to eat and able to take care of your family. For as it is written in the New Testament, in the great book of uh, what? Is it Hebrews? No. But it is written, a man that will not take care of his own family is worse than a heathen. And that's true. So I, I don't know, you know, you're, God gives you the rules and he tells you how to be successful. 
uh, I would think uh, if you believed upon him and loved him, you would take the advice. It's important that you do, beloved. 21. I, I want to say one other thing. Did you notice in a verse or so back, he said, it's, I want you to do well. I don't want you to go out here and do something that I've got to zap you. I want you to do this so you'll do well, so you can go in and take care of what I give you. Verse 21, teach your children. That's the point. 21, then thou shalt say unto thy son, we were Pharaoh's bondmen in Egypt. We were slaves. And the Lord, who? The Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. What does that say to a child? If, if they feel they're in bondage to the ways of this world, they know who to turn to then to be delivered out with blessings. And that's our Father, Yahweh. Our Father cares. He is real. He is a realist and so should you be. It's important to be successful whereby you have credibility. Now, again, I hope you don't think I'm saying, I'm speaking money is fine, blessings of God is fine, but that's not the only riches there is. Wisdom is far greater th than money. If I, had to, if I had to pick a choice of giving up all wisdom of God in my mind or what I have in the bank, I guarantee you it would be the bank that would go. Do you know why? Because if I chose the bank and lost my wisdom, I would lose what I had in the bank already. But if I have God's wisdom, I can lose what's in the bank, and I guarantee you my wisdom's going to fill the bank back up again. All right? I say my wisdom. It's God's wisdom that he has loaned me in how to be pleasing to God and now, and some might say, well, when I say fill the bank up, I mislead people. It, it may be 50 bucks over what I need. That's rich. If you got 50 bucks more than what you need each week, you've got 50 monk bucks of, of uh, after you've uh, taken care of the Lord for happy money, all right? So really, that's rich. You don't, then you don't have any left over you got to worry about, okay? But I'm saying, I, I'm trying to say this because I don't want you to think I'm only speaking uh, in a monetary sense. Success is impossible without peace of mind, and that's the richest thing in the world is to have wisdom because it will bring you peace of mind from the Father. The child must know it is God that delivers us from our enemies. Always has been from day one. If God said, don't go, you better not go. If God says, go, I will deliver them. They're as good as yours, all right? So you have to please him. 22, and the Lord showed signs and wonders, great and sore upon Egypt, upon Pharaoh, and upon all his household before our eyes. He worked those miracles, the plagues. We saw them. They didn't bother us. We prepared ahead of time. Why? We knew what was going to happen. When their water turned to blood, we had water stored. A word to the wise is sufficient, 23. And he brought us out from thence. Who did? We walked out. No, he, being our father, brought us out from thence that he, that he might, that he might what? That he might bring us in to give us the land which he swore unto our fathers. It was a promise. God always keeps his promises. 24, and the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes. Here it goes again, friend. Repetition, repetition. You must learn them. They're simple. To do, not only learn, but to do and keep all these statutes to fear, revere the Lord our God for our good always. Do you understand what that's saying? For it is for your good always that he might preserve us alive as it is at this day. It's just the way it's written. God preserve, it is for your good, not God's. Naturally, God's going to get the fallout. He's going to have a loving child, and that pleases him. It gives him pleasure. That's all he wants. But it's for your good 
in as much as you know how then to be successful and to be blessed. Well, why is it again I should learn the statutes and the judgments and the law? That's to say God's word for your good. Otherwise, you're not going to have too much going for you. You may think you do at times, but I guarantee you, if you do not have God, you don't have too much going for you, friend. I guarantee you, you're going to lose it. It may be when your little old shriveled up uh, flesh body withers and finally gives up the ghost. You may, you know, you're going to lose it then for sure. And you don't have anything after that. A wise person has a lot after that. 25. And it shall be our righteousness. Now listen carefully and weigh these. Meditate on these words. They're important. And it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God as he hath commanded. He counts it right when you do it. And that pleases him. Therefore, it turns them into um, your righteous acts because you're going to do them. Let me tell you something. When God, this word, fear God, I want you to do yourself a favor. I'm not going to do it for you. I want you to take your Strong's Concordance and break that word back to the Hebrew as it was in the manuscripts. And I want you to note that it can be translated fear or revere. Now, stop and think a moment real seriously. I realize it's translated fear. But when God has an overflowing love pouring from him saying, children, I want to help you. I want to help you go into this land that I've prepared for you and I want you to obey what I say. And at the same time, I want to scare the living daylights out of you. Does, does that make sense that that would flow? To, in my mind, it just kind of comes to a screeching halt. It's like the truth hits a brick wall. He said, I want you to learn to love me and do these things so I can bless you. I count it righteousness on your part. And beloved, your love for him and your brethren proves your faith. Show me no love, I'll show you and point to a man that has no faith. I want to say that again. Your love for your father and your brethren and especially your family, documents your faith in God. It's part of it. You can't read that and leave the love out. That's why that it grinds my mind just a little bit, gripes me, quite frankly, a little bit. Maybe that's a bad choice of words, but be that as it may. I'm a communicator, and it communicates the way I feel when I read fear when God's talking love. Okay? And you can think and reason that out for yourself without any problem whatsoever. God really loves his children. Can you read that chapter when he said, this is for your good. I want you to do well then how can you possibly picture a God that's up there with, uh, with his uh, arrow just waiting to zap somebody the first time they do something wrong, uh, painting him as somebody to be feared in the sense of being afraid of him? That's exactly the opposite response that he wants to draw from you. He wants your love. Uh, I don't like it, quite frankly, when other teachers would imply, they won't say it necessarily, maybe it's, I don't know, is it ignorance or what? I don't know that you should just go to bed at night shaking and fearing the living God. Well, that's, that's ridiculous. That goes 180 degrees off from what God teaches. He said, I, I want you to do good. Why? He said, I will show mercy, meaning I will show love. And everyone knows from the closing verse of uh, Revelation chapter 4 that God created man for his pleasure. 
So he wants pleasure from him, not somebody shaking in their boots, some wimpish, uh, cowardly person drawing back when you have your arm outstretched in love. So uh, maybe I'm hammering that a little bit too much, but I feel it. I feel that if you lose and do not understand the word fear here as revere love, that you lose the beautiful wonderment of the entire chapter, and it is beautiful indeed. I'm going to tell you something. This is how you have peace in your family, is doing it this way. Do your children as he has instructed you. He doesn't want you to have to go to some preacher and say, what saith the Lord? What does the what is what are the statutes concerning this? You're supposed to know them so that you can do them. Now, I'm not saying it isn't all right to have a teacher or a preacher that helps assist you in learning them, but do learn them. Do you remember what he said back um, several, uh, chapter 5, verse 1? He said, learn, keep, and do them. That's straight from the Father. How can it be made any simpler? Don't always look to someone else to do your thinking for you. Think for yourself. Chapter, only a cult will try to do your thinking for you. Um, I, I, uh, I enjoy teaching, but I sure wouldn't want to teach a bunch of people that could never rise above a wimpish state of not thinking for themselves. That wouldn't make me feel very good as a teacher because a good teacher wants his people, his students, to be able to be sharp, think for themselves, act without having to study for, you know, I don't I want to say jump into anything, but to be able to act for themselves and think for themselves, then he's done a pretty good job of teaching. So I really don't know. These cults that will not answer questions uh, from their uh, church congregation, and now they just believe what I say and don't question me. You know? That's a cult, and I know I offend some of the good brethren, but then I'm not in the business of, of uh, trying to please brethren, but to teach God's Word, and if, if they're good brethren, they'll understand that. So think for yourself. That's what your Father wants you to do in His Word, in His law, and in His leading of you. Please never forget the one thing that the commandments, uh, you know, I, and I don't want you to ever forget what I'm about to say, for I'm going to even simplify it past what it was, and I'm not talking down to anybody. I just don't want you to miss it. The commandments, the statutes, and the judgments are for your good. They're not for your harm. They're not to discomfort you. God didn't dream them up to make life miserable for you, but for your good so that you have a better life. Now, many times, traditions and things that are not written can take those things that are good that are supposed to set you free and put you into bondage, and that causes confusion in so-called religion. That's why I want you to think for yourself. Don't let any man put you in bondage. There's only one way you can think for yourself, and that is to understand God's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse, and know foremost of all that He loves you and He wants your love in return. That's not asking much, friend. He wants your love. It makes His day. It pleases Him, and it's for your good naturally to obey Him because He knows what's best for us, and we don't. Example, he knows what's going to happen next week. We don't. So when you ask him a thing, know that he answers it in what's best for you and for your good for the long run, for he knows. Your love in him will create a trust that will document your faith in him, that you trust him to the point that however he answers it, you know it is for your benefit and best.
I wonder about people that will say, well, I prayed for this and God never give it to me. You know, it's like, I'm kind of mad at God because he didn't give me what I prayed for. And that goes against the whole grain because it shows they don't have faith in God to give them what's best for them, for what, they're, what is good for them. If God loves you, he's going to give you what's best for you. Have enough faith in him to know that. These words, uh, am I having trouble speaking today? I think so. For it is a very deep thought and yet a very simple thought. And I suppose it's all involved and evolves around love itself for our Father. He loves you and he wants the best for you. Love him in return. All right, bless your hearts. You listen a moment, won't you?